Chairman, Principal, ladies and gentlemen, it's a, a great pleasure to have this opportunity to discuss regenerative medicine uh, with you. I'd like to provide a context for modern biomedical research by actually looking back into the past and looking at the way in which treatments, which these days I think we take for granted, but which have been of great benefit to most of us, were developed and have matured over the years. And then I'll turn and look forward into the way in which I think that regenerative medicine can do similar things in the future. If you think in terms of immunization, vaccination, which is something which I'm sure all of us have, have had for one disease or another, it's around about 300 years since people were first beginning to think of, of this, uh, when a technique which had arisen in the Far East moved gradually around the world to Europe. Um, because people had begun to realize that someone who had been infected by a particular disease rarely was infected again. And that it was possible that if you took infective material from one person or an animal in fact and put it into somebody who had not had the infection, that you could give resistance to the infection. And it was Jenner in this country who, 1790 or thereabouts, first looked at this systematically taking cowpox infection and putting it into people and finding that that conferred resistance to smallpox infection. And during the 19th century, there was a, a steady flow of both basic biological work to understand what was happening in this situation and empirical studies to try things in the hope that they would work, which led to the development of the first vaccines for a variety of different diseases. The beginning of the 20th century, I think there were vaccines available for many diseases, whooping cough, TB. But it's a process which took many more years to reach the full collection of treatments which probably most of our children and grandchildren have had. I expect most of us remember the 1950s when smallpox vaccination came through. Uh, Joseph Salt from the uh, United States developing one particular treatment. So this is a, a thing which we take for granted, which has removed the, the occurrence of many childhood diseases. It's increased our lifespan, our health span. Because of research carried out of, over a period of two or three hundred years. Another um, thing to remember, actually, uh, with a great contribution from here in Edinburgh, is the introduction of anaesthetics with James Simpson being somebody who had a, a huge role to play in that uh, development. I'm sure all of you know that the maternity clinic, clinic here at the Royal Infirmary is named after him. Reflecting the great benefit to women in childbirth because he was one of the first people to uh, uh, administer chloroform and other anaesthetics to women as a way of ameliorating the pain uh, of childbirth. And of course, We've all seen representations of one kind or another of surgery being carried out in those days without anesthesia, when really the approach seemed to be to be as quick as possible, um, but there was very, very little possibility of preventing the development of pain until people like Simpson did experiments on themselves and their friends to identify the compounds which were able to, to render somebody insensible but uh, with a, a full recovery. I imagine many of you know that at the time of his funeral, uh, the streets of Edinburgh were lined by thousands of people in respect, uh, showing respect for the contribution that he'd made. And he is, of course, buried in, in Westminster Abbey. But I, I also imagine that after the initial realization that it was possible to identify compounds which could be effective like this, there was further research over a period of years to develop the compounds which are used now. And I guess most of us in this room will have had an anesthetic, if nothing else, a local anaesthetic for uh, dental treatment, if not a general anaesthetic. So again, it's something which has matured over a period of years and which we uh, have great benefit from and perhaps take for granted. The 19th century was also a period when people appreciated the benefit of aseptic technique. Because uh, uh, until then, women who had successfully delivered children were often uh, the victim of a secondary infection, which might claim their life if not uh, uh, just make them seriously ill. 
And it was Joseph Lister who worked here, Glasgow and London, who first recognized the important benefits from clean technique, aseptic technique, and the use of sterilizing compounds like carbolic acid. And again, this is something which I'm sure has been refined over the years to be a much more effective uh, procedure. And I think just a minute, few minutes research with Google on the computer would demonstrate similar sequences with antibiotics, with the first treatments for cancer. And of course, if you come into the last 50 years or so, there have been many things which have been developed, like microsurgery, which is critical for organ transplantation, in vitro fertilization, um, a whole range of different things which have come about in the last 50 years. Now, I personally think that if we could look, for, look backwards from 100 years into the future, we would find that regenerative medicine will have made a contribution of a similar scale to any of the things that I've mentioned. And in a few minutes, I'll start to try to explain why. But that it will have taken most of that period of time for these new techniques to reach their full maturity. That's not to say that there won't be some treatments in the next five years, ten years. But in just the same way that people are still improving the vaccination processes that are used now, people will continue to improve the use of knowledge from uh, stem cell research for a very long time into the future. So stem cells, as the chairman indicated, the things which will come in from the center of regenerative medicine will arise from research with stem cells. What, what are they? What do we actually mean by stem cells? Well, a very important stem cell, if you like, is the embryo. Because from that single cell comes all of, come all of the different tissues that make up a person. Bone and muscle and skin, the, the nervous system. And almost all of those cells have the same genetic information. There are a few exceptions, but almost all of them have the same genetic information. And the way in which all of the different tissues are formed is because there are a series of mechanisms which control the way that the genetic information functions so that some cells will become muscle and some will become skin. We're beginning to understand some of those mechanisms, but it would be wrong to say that we understand them fully. Until 10 years or so ago, we used to think that the mechanisms which bring about those changes were so complex and so rigidly fixed that it would not be possible to reverse them. And the most profound outcome from the Dolly experiment was to demonstrate that that's not true. If you put the genetic information into an egg, in some cases, its function will be changed back to be that equivalent to an embryo at the very beginning of development. And, and that embryo will be able to develop to term and produce a clone. But in a few moments, I'm going to come to a, a more startling way of achieving similar things, uh, which I think will be critical, is already critical for stem cell research. It is possible in some species, including our own, to derive stem cells from embryos, which retain the ability to form all of the different tissues, embryo stem cells. They are called pluripotent because of this potency, this ability to form all of the different tissues. They have a second characteristic, which is that they can grow for a very long period of time. So you can produce extraordinarily large numbers of cells which are genetically and physiologically the same and retaining the ability to form all of the different tissues. An extraordinary potential, which has been very important in research in the mouse, which was the first species from which embryo stem cells were obtained. As development takes place, the different tissues are formed, and it's now becoming clear that in most, if not all of them, there are different stem cells, which are characteristic of each tissue. They would be sometimes known as adult or tissue-specific stem cells. So that there are stem cells in the heart, for example, in muscle, in some tissues, they're very active stem cells in the skin and in the digestive tract, in the, in the bone marrow where they pr produce our blood cells. So some of these, like in the, in the heart, are relatively inactive, in the central nervous system, relatively inactive, whereas in others, they are absolutely critical for our survival because they're replacing their, their predecessors at an extraordinarily quick rate. 
These cells have the ability to form only a limited range of tissues normally. And they have a shorter period of life, typically, than the embryo stem cells. But cells taken from a particular person have the advantage that you can put them back into that person without facing immune rejection because they are genetically and physiologically identical to that person. And so in the past, there's been this tension that embryo stem cells have the potential to form all of the different tissues, form many cells, but would be rejected, typically, if you put them into a person. Whereas adult stem cells have a limited potential to develop, but they are genetically matched to the person. Well, there was an extraordinary experiment that I alluded to a few minutes ago which has shown that it is possible to take adult tissue, not necessarily stem cells, and by putting into them a number of the critical factors which maintain embryo stem cells, a small proportion of these cells become equivalent to embryo stem cells. They're called induced pluripotent, that's that same word, pluripotent stem cells. So this is finding a way of bringing together the advantages of both a tissue-specific, an adult stem cell, and that it's equivalent to the person, but yet with the potential to form all of the different tissues. And it's, it's having an ex extraordinary effect already on research in this area, even though the experiment I'm referring to, which was carried out in Japan by Professor Shinya Yamanaka, is only a little over two years old. When we think of stem cells and therapy, we almost always leap straight to the idea of cell therapy, of being able to replace those cells in a person that have been lost or damaged because of a particular disease. And we think that to focus on that is to overlook the enormous potential benefits of being able to use these cells for research. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that before coming back finally to the subject of cell therapy. There are inherited cases of many of the diseases that you would hear mentioned in the context of cell, stem cell research. Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, um, cancers. Motor neuron disease is one where there is a particular focus of activity here in, in Edinburgh. And there are about 5% um, of cases are, are inherited uh, of this particular disease. What this means is that if we use the new technique of producing pluripotent cells from a cell taken from somebody who has this disease and has inherited it, these cells are genetically equivalent to the cells in that person and from a physiological point of view equivalent to those in the, in the person when they were a fetus or a newborn child. So this is creating extraordinary new opportunities to study the development of the disease. Motor neuron disease, as its name implies, affects nerves in the brain and in the spinal cord. So it's not possible to obtain them from patients. By the time they pass away, there are many secondary changes. And researchers in this field have been impatient to have cells of the kind I've just mentioned to study for a long time. And this is creating the new opportunity. So a number of labs, including one in the center, have got cells which are equivalent to those with, from patients with inherited forms of, of motor neuron disease. So we can contrast these with cells from a health, healthy person to try to identify for the first time the difference. What is it that's functioning differently, abnormally, uh, in, the, in the patient and ultimately leading to the symptoms of motor neuron disease? If we can identify that, it may be possible to find a way of having a high throughput assay, a high throughput test in the laboratory to look for compounds which are able to prevent those symptoms or, the, or at least perhaps the next stage to prevent the effects of those symptoms. It's believed to be an abnormal accumulation of a protein outside the nucleus. So can we find ways of, of changing, changing that? So this is a totally new opportunity to study any of the many inherited diseases where the cause isn't known, provided only that we can form the tissue which is affected in the disease. And there are colleagues here in the university who can produce motor neurons and other nerves in the lab 
from these pluripotent cells. Given only the ability to make pluripotent cells and the ability to make them the tissue which is affected, this can be used to study a range of different diseases. So, although this is new, we've already had conversations with colleagues who are interested in a number of other neurodegenerative diseases, but something as dis different as asthma, for example. So there'll be, I think, an extraordinary explosion of activity using these new techniques and casting light onto at least some of these diseases. It's terribly easy in the optimism of the new moment to give the impression that we'll solve all of the problems in five years. And I've already indicated it'll take longer than five years. It's also important to point out that there will sometimes be technical reasons why we can't understand some of the diseases. It's important to mention that as well. So cell therapy. I think that cell therapy will come along. Some of you will have noticed that there was permission granted recently for two clinical trials in Scotland, one of which involves the, the centre, one in, involves a company based in, in the south of England, um, treating uh, different forms of uh, eye uh, disease in one case and stroke in the other. So cell therapy will certainly come through. I personally have never believed in patient-specific cell therapy. There are hundreds of thousands of people in this country alone, and by that of course I'm in Scotland, with diseases like Parkinson's, diabetes, hundreds of thousands of new patients every year. To think that you could produce a cell line for each person, I think, is just not practicable. The adva another advantage of the induced pluripotent cells is because you know the person they came from, you know the genetic makeup, you know the genotype, the blood type. So it means it becomes feasible to think of creating a bank of very carefully selected genotypes. And there are people doing the calculations as to how many cell lines you'd need to have in a library in order to be able to treat most people with a reasonable uh, immunological match. And it's, it's of the order of 100 which is, I think, an attainable number, whereas individual treatment pro probably isn't, isn't uh, attainable, in my view. There's a difference between the research I described first and the therapy in that if you're going to put cells into people, you need to know absolutely everything about them and to be absolutely certain of their quality, that they are exactly what you think they are, which is really challenging with our present state of knowledge. You can tolerate rather greater error if you're going to use the cells in the laboratory for this screening sort of approach. You want them to be as good as possible, but a slight error would be acceptable. So I think my view is that for a number of years, perhaps a decade or two, most of the use will be for research, during which time not only will we learn about diseases, but we'll also become more adept at controlling and producing exactly the cell types that we want. And then it will be possible to, and practicable to think carefully about how to use the cells in therapy. So just one more point. I hope I've painted out to you ways in which this research may contribute uh, new treatments. I think Edinburgh is particularly well placed to carry out this sort of research because of its medical school, part of which is next to the Royal Infirmary, so that I and my colleagues will be based in our new building at the back of the Royal in Infirmary with immediate access to clinicians and patients, with a clinical trials unit, well positioned to, to organize this very critical stage in the development of new therapies. The biopark wrapped around the back of the Royal Infirmary will provide a superb environment for companies. And we have a very strong commitment to work with them through ERI, um, with the support of Scottish Enterprise as well, to attract companies and to start new companies to exploit this, this knowledge. And then last but not least, my colleagues are very strongly committed to, to the importance of training. It's pointless developing these therapies if we don't have people able to carry out all of the necessary steps, producing the cells, marketing the cells, putting the cells into the people, applying the drugs. And we have a very strong commitment to training each of these different aspects. So I'm only sorry that I'm not going to be able to look back from 100 years into the future because I think that we will be very proud of what will be achieved by this new centre during that period of time. Thank you very much.